Strategic Marketing Plan, First Half. This is a guide for the first half of the Strategic Marketing Plan. It includes both a Situation Analysis and a SWOT Analysis, which is indicated in the orange step Roman numeral 1. It addresses the question, where are we now? The red outline box is a format for completing the first half of the strategic marketing plan. You first present an overview of the client, then the situation analysis, which is both an internal and an external analysis of the organization. What you learn from the internal and external analysis, analysis is introduced as observations into the SWOT analysis. The acronym SWOT means Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. This is followed by a conclusion or summary of the SWOT analysis. This will be the information that becomes the springboard for the objectives in the next half of the plan, which will be the uh, answering the question, where do we want to be? Please note in your submission you do not use Roman numerals only section titles and subtitles. This outline is posted in Blackboard under the Strategic Marketing Plan Toolkit and also in the syllabus. You might find it helpful to look at the UK Beverage Industry Strategic Marketing Plan that is also posted in Blackboard. But here, please note that the formatting is slightly different than what is recommended for this Strategic Marketing Plan. The first step to begin the strategic marketing plan is to make sure you are familiar with all of the resources provided in the strategic marketing plan toolkit posted on Blackboard. Please note that there are generic internal factors that you might find helpful to review as you begin the situation analysis part of your plan. Likewise, there are generic external factors that are also good to review. These are ones that come from both the macro and micro external environment. We have also posted a separate file on specific micro external factors that would be good to review, as well as macro external factors that relate to the economic, political, technological, social, and biophysical environments. A snapshot, uh, that's that colored picture you see on the screen, uh, of the macro external factors or the pestle factors is captured uh, in Blackboard for an immediate reference. The toolkit also has a generic list of strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that would be good to review as you work on the situation analysis part of the strategic marketing plan. Now I'm going to take you through the entire first part of the plan and explain why this approach is important in building your strategic marketing plan. Remember, the first phase is only to address the question, where are we now? As such, you are looking inside the box or internally at your organization. And you also look outside the box, so to speak, at the external environment and how these factors may affect the organization you have selected. Generally, you have control only over the internal environment. Uh, and uh, there's little you can do about the external environment. To help you better assess the internal environment, you must first describe what your client is doing in terms of their product. How are they pricing it? How is it distributed or placed? And how is it promoted? The people and physical evidence are particularly important for service products. Physical evidence would include anything tangible that surrounds a service product. So if your client was a, um, was a medical practice, a service provider, the waiting room or, or the examination room are physical evidence. Even a logo is physical evidence. Profitability and performance can be evaluated through such measurements as a gross profit margin, net profit, break-even points, or even return on investment. 
of your client's firm or business. The PLC and McKinsey's Matrix I am going to discuss in the next slides in just a second. The final internal assessment is what the client's business is doing in terms of targeting and positioning its product. The external analysis includes both a macro and a micro assessment. The macro assessment looks at the big picture, the state of the economy, the political and legal frameworks of the business sector, uh, technological developments that might impact the client, as well as social and environmental factors. The microanalysis is at the firm level. Who are the competitors? What are customers wanting and what are their needs and what trends can be observed? You might find that Porter's power forces are helpful in the external microanalysis as well as knowing who your stakeholders are. And I'm going to discuss those a little bit more in depth in just a few minutes. Let's for now go back to the internal analysis and the McKinsey matrix, which while interesting is a bit difficult to use. First of all, you should note that the 3 by 3 table is driven by two variables, the external market attractiveness of the business and the internal strength of the business. For this example, we have arbitrarily selected factors for each of the variables to score the business. Depending on how the business scores, the client will have insights on whether they should invest and grow the green squares, be more cautious and selective with their investment, the yellow squares, or harvest and divest, which would be the lower right red squares. How the scoring works is that a weight is given each factor in both the variables, attractiveness and business strength. The weighting cannot be more than one, and the scoring is done on a scale of one to five, with five being the strongest or most attractive. As you can see in the table, the weight is then multiplied by the score for a total on each row. Then all of the factor totals are summed for a final total. So the final score for the business in terms of attractiveness is 405, and for business strength, it is 3.6. These numbers are then placed on the McKinsey grid. In this case, it appears that the business falls within the green or invest and grow area. The McKinsey matrix is typically used in portfolio management when a business is comparing several of its business units and making decisions in investing or even divesting. This is an example that was used with Marriott Hotels and a number of their hotel lines. As you can see, the W Hotels score extremely well, but the Protea Hotels, not so well. This may be more important for Marriott when reviewing the complementary aspects of their different hotel lines. It is difficult to use because it is subjective, and whomever is assigning the factor values has to have lots of experience and business depth. The product life cycle is probably a model that you will find more immediately useful in the internal analysis of your client's business or organization. You will notice that there is not that much profit typically until a business enters its growth stage of the cycle. You will note in the yellow boxes below each stage are general recommendations of what the business should be doing. For example, in the introductory stage of the cycle, the marketing and promotion investment is high because the company wants to get the product into hands of customers. During the growth stage, competition is likely to grow and here the business will want to be aimed at increasing its share of the market. Once they enter the mature phase of the cycle, they've reached saturation point and sales will begin to, to decline. In the last phase of the cycle, the business will want uh, to decide if it's time to divest of the product or maybe redesign it to change its trajectory. For the microanalysis, microexternal analysis, Porter's five power forces may be useful for some teams to use. Here the five forces are laid out as the competitive rival rivalry that exists for the company, the threats of new entrants, 
the threats of possible substitutes, the bargaining power of suppliers, and the bargaining power of buyers. If we use the simple example of ground beef, it is easy to see how this model might be useful. We would need to know who the competitors are and what new companies might be soon offering their own product or packaged meat at the grocery store where we are selling. Then there is the threat of substitutes that might come on board, like the new plant protein meatless burgers that are becoming very popular. The bargaining power of suppliers and the bargaining power of buyers is always in flux and always needs to be taken into consideration. The supplier has a lot of bargaining power when goods are in short supply and demand is high. This happened at some grocery stores during COVID. At the same time, if there is plentiful supply and only a few shoppers, there is a buyer's market. Ground meat is fairly simple to understand, but other products are more complex and require a bit more thought. For example, the housing market. If my client is Long and Foster in Washington, D.C., I will note that I have plenty of competition of rivals from firms like Coldwell Banker and Washington Fine Properties. I also might be somewhat leery of new entrants coming on the block like Urban Homes and Smith and & Robert. Furthermore, I know that Generation Z is less interested in home ownership and maybe more seriously looking at substitutes like owning a houseboat or an RV. The bargaining power of suppliers and buyers is also in flux just as it was with ground beef. The next two slides will illustrate who is in the driver's seat, so to speak, and when. If there is a lot of housing stock and a dwindling number of purchasers, we are in a buyer's market with supply exceeding demand. This might be in the situation that we find ourselves in 2022 with the threats of a recession looming. At the same time, there are certain neighborhoods and zip codes that always seem to be in demand. That is, too many people chasing too little of product. And in that situation, you have a seller's market. The last part of the external analysis is reporting on your stakeholders. You need to examine them from both the internal stakeholders, like your employees, managers and shareholders, as well as your external stakeholders like customers, suppliers, labor unions, and community groups. Each client will have their own unique set of stakeholders. Nonprofit institutions can vary greatly in size and depth and have their own set of stakeholders that includes its own members, its donors, government and industry professionals, partners, grantors, and sponsors, its volunteers, the community, and the employees of the organization. After your internal and an external analysis, you then get to your SWOT analysis. Uh, here, it's very important for you to be careful that you do not confuse in the SWOT analysis weaknesses with threats. This often happens. Just remember a threat is always something external to the organization. Have a look at some of the examples that we have here. Opportunities is another SWOT area that students sometimes confuse with strengths of their organization. An opportunity must be something external to the organization, such as a situation, an event, a trend that the organization can exploit or use to their advantage. Again here, take a look at the list that we have compiled of some possible opportunities. So from the internal and an external analysis will be many observations that you will be able to capture in the SWOT matrix. Just always remember the side of the tree, the leaves are falling. Is it from the internal analysis? The internal here would be the left side of the tree 
or is it from the external analysis or the right side of the tree? The internal observations will be co compiled under strengths and weaknesses and the external observations will be compiled in the opportunities and threats quadrants. Here are just a few formatting tips that I'm going to end on for you to read over before you submit your assignment. If you have any questions during the research phase or writing of the first half of the strategic marketing plan, please do not hesitate to call me, your professor, or uh, your section leader. We are here to help.